All right, I'm going to need your help this morning. I know it's snowing out there and it's a little bit cold, but I'm going to need your help. When I say the word jubilee, what comes to your mind? Jubilee. All right, I need to hear it. Old celebration, party, bells. Across the street, the Jubilee Center, absolutely. All right, this is good, this is good. Party, fun, excitement, all of these things. The dictionary says and is right with you that it's a celebration of certain anniversaries. Uh, the 25th is a silver Jubilee. The 50th is a golden Jubilee. The completion of 50 years of existence or activity or like that type of celebration. And then more of what we were saying, any season or occasion of rejoicing or festivity, rejoicing or jubilation. And those, that's kind of where my mind goes as well, those last two things. Whatever it is, Jubilee is amazing. It's exciting. It's a party. It's a festival. Dictionary.com also does include our biblical definition, a year-long period to be observed once every 50 years, during which slaves are to be freed, alienated lands are to be restored to their original owner or an heir, and the fields were to be left untilled, and all agricultural laborers were to be suspended. This is from Leviticus 25. This is what Isaiah is describing in our passage this morning. Now, we have talked a lot about the exile of the Israelite people out of their land from both the southern and northern kingdom. But don't worry if you can't keep track because Everett Schlater is in our midst and we can rely on his good biblical knowledge. What is important to remember this morning is that we are in what pastor, or sorry, what scholars like to call is third Isaiah. There are three phases of Isaiah, and this is the third part, where it's thought that they have come back from exile, back into the land that is supposed to be flowing with milk and honey, and it's not going as they expected. Life is hard, making new things, new life, new ways of being and doing, it's hard. There's a delay in rebuilding the temple, a delay in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and there's some resistance from the people who are in the land. I'm certain that they're frustrated. Isaiah is addressing them, and he is casting this vision of hope, good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners. He describes the year of Jubilee. And in doing so, he's describing the coming of the Messiah. I've never been in prison, although I have friends and family who have been. When Isaiah says the coming of the year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the Messiah is like getting out of prison, I have to wonder. And so I looked it up. Marat Morrison, who describes himself online as a writer, artist, and idiot, but not in that order, says of the first day of getting out of prison. And I want to read this whole thing for you. Seven years. Imagine seven years of dreams, desires, fears, regrets, flowing like a river, cleansing your soul, removing the grime of desperation, taking away the filth, of living in a box. It feels like teen spirit. It feels like having one foot in the grave and the other slipping. Because it ain't over. You still have parole and you can go back. I did. It feels like freedom. The sweetest kind you can imagine while also feeling like a temporary tattoo. Like a kiss from a beauty queen at a state fair. The one you, the one you paid for but one you know will not last or linger. It feels like hell. You cannot help but have dreams about prison for the next few months, nightmares about going back. And you certainly can never look at another police officer as a source of help ever again. That relationship has changed forever. No matter what you feel, the one thing you feel and know for certain is you are an outsider from that point on. 
Friends and family alike let you know right away that you are not trusted anymore. You have no money. Unless you are some sort of genius and covered that before you went in, I did not. No clothes, nowhere to live, nowhere to work, no way to get around. And if you are lucky in Indiana, you may have $50 to start your new life. You are hopeless. You are an outsider. You are most likely alone. You feel effed in the worst way because you know it is all your fault. While I tailored some of that for church, the crassness of his response explains the difficulty of the situation, which is why I pass it along. That's not necessarily what I was thinking of, not necessarily what I was thinking I would find when I looked up what it felt like to be released from prison. But of course, as with anything in this life, even the best things can bring challenges and heartache. It is why we have to wait Wait for Jesus to come, for the last day when all things will be made right and new. It is why it matters that Jesus is born in the first place. We cannot do this life by ourselves. I mean, we can, but it's much more painful. The prophets tell us that Jesus' spirit, that the spirit of God is upon us. And this is good news, but we need Jesus too. Jesus himself read this passage of Isaiah in Luke, and apparently it's one of my favorite passages because if you are taking notes, this has come up for me quite so many times in sermons here. This was given this time by the narrative lectionary. In the Gospel of Luke, as the first of his public acts of ministry, Jesus went to the synagogue like he often did, and he stood up to read scripture again like he often did, and he read this passage. But this time, he claimed it as his own. They gave him the scroll, and he found this place in Isaiah and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is what we call Jesus' mic drop for those of the youth out there. He read that, and then he said, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and he sat down. Boom. These promises are amazing But we need Jesus to bring them, to make them come true, to orient ourselves to them, to make sure we accept them, to hold out our hand and show us how to do this for others. For this is what Jesus came to do, and this is what we are supposed to do as well. We're supposed to turn the world upside down. The ones society wants to lock up, those are the ones we should set free the poor, the outcast, those who don't fit in, and those who are excluded for being different. The one society wants to ignore, the hungry, the hurting, the sick, those are the ones we should attend to. The ones our city wants to cast out, those who turn violent, those who can't follow the rules, those who can't keep their clothes clean, those are the ones we are supposed to take in. And it's not easy That is what Jesus did and what Jesus calls us to do. I have another description of what it feels like to get out of prison. A man writing under the pseudonym Christopher Haas casts getting out of prison in a different way, and I want you to hear this encounter as well. I stepped out into a cloudy, overcast day. But some rays of sun hit me on the face as I took my first deep breath of air in the free world in 21 years. It was exhilarating to be outside, not surrounded by a fence. It felt unbelievable. All those years locked up of being transported in handcuffs and chains. And now the five of us, all ex-felons with hard time under our belts, were just dumped out at the little mom and pop bus station in rinky dink country. Waiting for the bus with others, I thought about other ways I had changed over the years. Being the guy who was in the mix, involved in the politics and drama of prison life, didn't appeal to me anymore. Holding things down, 
regulating stuff or running things in prison, having a solid reputation used to be important to me. But now, what was it worth? I walked out of prison, I believe, capable of doing whatever it takes to keep my freedom and my sobriety, which is a necessary component of my freedom. The process to get here wasn't so much giving up the old me, more of reverting to who I was when I was just a kid before I got involved in drugs and crime. It was a matter of stripping off the layers, the tough guy facade, the anti-authority, hate the world mentality. That was never me, just someone I invented to impress others. And this is what Jesus does for us. Jesus strips off the layers, the facade we present to one another to impress or to be able to deal with life. And then Jesus sets us free. Jesus sets us free from, free from hatred, free from labels, free from lies, violence, destruction. But more importantly, Jesus sets us free for, free for love, free for peace, free for equity, free for justice, free for compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the Messiah. This is what we wait for. This is the good news of Christmas. Because Jesus not only promises to come to make all things right and new, but Jesus promises to help us in making all things right and new, in making this world a better place for you, for me, and for those we barely even see. Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the Messiah. This is like when someone says, wait for it, there's often something good coming. A surprise, a secret, a hope, a good word, wait for it. So I need your help again. I'm going to say wait for it, and you're going to shout out the secret. The secret here is the passage from Isaiah. So if you need to pull your bulletin back out, pick out one of those phrases of hope or wholeness that speaks to you. Maybe it's good news to the oppressed, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming, leaf, proclaiming liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, comfort to all who mourn. Pick one of those or another that's in there. And I want all of that hope to fill this sanctuary, to fill our lives, to fill our hearts. So I'm going to say wait for it, and you're going to shout out this hope from Isaiah. Are you ready? Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Amen and amen.